That's better. <laughs> you gotta get all the right, back- I had to, had to get all pretty for TV, you know. <laughs> gotta gotta make sure we have the right background, that's for sure. It's just connecting now. Is this this not is this going live? Yes. Oh, okay. So then, uh, I mean, do you edit the podcast? Does uh, I'll trim down the audio. And um, so what I do, I let this go live. And then when it comes to putting together the audio stuff, I'll just kind of go through it and balance out the sound levels, tack on some music, yeah. take out some. Yeah. Ums when, and and when, when, will that, when do you expect that'll be up? Uh, a few days. Yeah, I okay. usually get it done in a few days or so. Yeah, so thanks again for doing this, Steve. I really appreciate it. Sure. Glad to be here. I do like the pots and pans in the background. You're right. That is a nice little touch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get... Uh, I, we do a thing, the Times, Times Union Journalists and CBS 6 do a weekend segment, and uh, I get more comments about pans from Channel 6 viewers uh, than I do about the content of the segments. You know, somebody really? will completely write about the, oh, what, what is that? Where did you get that? It's like, it's, uh, you know, a tool board from Sears. <laughs> do you have a preferred type of pan you use? Because mine are kind of garbage and, uh, and I've had for years. Oh, well, uh, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of different yeah. ones. You know, different pans for, uh, I mean, the copper ones are really expensive and kind of a pain to clean. Um, but they cook beautifully and I like those also because they look great. You know, a, a, a really good nonstick pan is essential, but you just have to assume that that after four or five years, it's non-stickness will be gone. You're going to toss it out and buy a new one. Um, whereas, you know, I have anodized aluminum from Calphalon that I've had for more than 20 years. Oh, wow. So, you know, and, and cast iron will be a generational thing that you eventually fob off on somebody when you die <laughs> that's one way to look at it i take it uh you're very much into cooking then with the pots and pans are you there pots. looks like you froze i'm here looks like you froze a little bit well it says live but you're frozen really i can hear you just fine uh okay i guess we'll just keep talking can you still hear me having some technical difficulties. You back? Yep, I'm back. I, of course, apparently my internet had a hiccup. (laughs) (laughs) Great timing. It's been fine. It hasn't happened in quite some time. So, uh, it still says everything's rolling. So. All right. Okay. But uh, perhaps I should do an intro <laughs> before I forget. Uh, if you see me looking to the side a lot, it's just because I have my notes over there. But uh, so welcome to Stories from a Virtual Bar, everyone. Uh, could be episode 41. Hate those words. Hate those words. Virtual bar. Not your <laughs> fault. But what no. they imply is terrible. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's, uh, there's, been, there's been some positives, at least. Uh, I can... I drink more when I'm at home. My couch is only five feet away and I constantly wear shorts instead of having to put on real pants. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, it, it could be if I were to stand up that you would see that I too have shorts on uh, under this dapper blazer. However, I'm not standing up. <laughs> yeah, me either. So uh, I'm of course the host Chris Osborne and today I am joined by Steve Barnes from the Albany Times Union. How are you, sir? I'm very well, thanks. Glad to be here. Awesome. Super happy you're doing this. Happy, uh, excited to chat with you. Uh, I love, uh, it's fun following all your blog posts for table hopping and stuff like that. Uh, I like your writing. Actually, <laughs> there's one article I'll talk to you a bit later on. They got some fun stuff to get into. Uh, but first, I'd like to say, uh, we're recording this fairly early, so I'm nothing like a good pre-lunch beer. 
that I'm drinking right here as I like to do. Uh, I don't know. Are you drinking, sipping on anything in particular? Well, I, I have, I have seltzer with lime because okay. I, I always do a cold brewed co coffee, but it, it takes a while for it to uh, run through the filter. And so I, I thought, that it would be through the filter by the time we started, but it hasn't. So I, I have switched to seltzer with lime, uh, to which I am addicted. I oh. probably drink two liters of it a day. So I am always a well hydrated and B won't get scurvy. <laughs> it's very important to watch out for the scurvy. Yes. I like sailing. So, you know, I understand that's a, was a problem once. Yes. But, uh, no, I'm drinking a beer from the warbler brewery that opened up, uh, only a few months ago in Del Mar. Yep. I'm, drink, I'm drinking their Pilsner. And honestly, I think this is one of the best Pilsners I've ever, I've ever had. So shout, uh, out to, love, shout out to them. It's a little, you know, contrary to the season, I think. You know, Pilsner I associate with being, you know, bright and warm outside. But certainly, uh, I love a good Pilsner. So I will check it out. I haven't been over there yet. Yeah, I have. Uh, luckily, I found these in a local be uh, beverage center. I actually stopped at Uptown Beverage in Schenectady and they had it. Mm. Del I live in Niska, you know, so Del Mar's a little bit of a drive. Right. But uh, yeah, it's good. It's definitely, uh, I, drink, I mean, I drink a lot of IPAs and stuff like that. So it was nice to switch it up when I came across this. And but, it, is it is before noon. So it's... It is. I try to keep it light before noon. <laughs> Less <laughs> get, of a powerhouse. Yeah. Get, in, get into the heavy stuff later on in the day. Because I've got nothing going on today. Fortunately, it's my day off. It's snowing. Uh, I'll be watching some movies and probably playing some video games later. So that's the extent of my day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, where was I going? So, I mean, what are you doing with your day today? Is this a day off for you? I know you mentioned. Yes. Uh, I have. All right. I completely acknowledge that what I'm about to say will sound terrible in a pandemic time. Um, uh, but, uh, I have a lot of vacation. I've been at the times union. It'll be 25 years in July and I have five weeks of vacation and it's very difficult for me to take all of it. Um, well, normally it is because, you know, I, I'm busy and there's a lot of things to do. Uh, so what I tend to do is burn on our, and our vacation year for whatever reason <laughs> runs May to April. Really? So yeah, I, I, our, our sick time year and, and personal days year runs calendar January to December, but our vacation is May to April. And I get to the end of it and we lose our vacation. We don't use it. So I, I tend to take Fridays off at the beginning of the year to use up all of my vacation time. See, I, uh, I'm in a similar boat, actually. I ended up rolling over pretty much all of my vacation from last year because, uh, you know, as stuff started closing down and the worry was growing, they adjusted my work hours. So I was kind of working from home half the week for like 20 hours and then only working in the office 20 hours. I'm like, if, if I'm already home, I'm like, I, I don't have a reason to burn vacation time. There's nowhere to go. So I ended up right. rolling it over mostly. Plus, well, I'm that's nice. A, you can roll it over. That's uh, Oh, yeah. We can roll over up to four weeks. And then I have to use that four weeks. And, of course, the next year. Uh, or I lose it. <clears throat> but I'm also off every other Friday. So I work my, like, my 80. I'm on a 980 schedule. So I work mm. 80 hours, work for, for one Friday, have the next off. Nine nice. hours. It, oh, it's great. It's given me a chance to do some more live streams here. This is actually my third one. And the first time the internet's gone out on me, well, I've done it. So that was fun. <laughs> well, it's only happened once. So yeah, so far. We'll see if we can get through the rest of the 50, 50 minutes remaining. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I started doing this more, although I think I'm going to start doing maybe something like every third week. It's kind of cutting into uh, some video game and reading and hobby time. <laughs> <laughs> More so than I thought. This takes a lot of work, people, to try to keep up with this. Between some editing, uh, I kind of write some stuff for Nipper Town to go along with the audio episodes when I have those ready to post. And Nipper Town, a great publication for anyone that's not, not in the know on there about all kinds of local arts and stuff going on. Plus, I, uh, I started doing another podcast in my free time, Popcorn and Pints, where I hang out with some friends and we talk movies on Saturday nights. So... Nice. You know, a lot of a lot of stuff to try to keep busy these days. I mean, I take it for, uh, at the Times Union. Can you? I, I assume you could do a lot of your work from home. Is that the case? Oh, I have not. I literally have not stepped foot in the office since the twelfth of March. Oh, <laughs> so it's cow. been more than eleven months. I mean, I, I have not gone in at all because they they were really strict about it. 
and everything. And I do feel really bad because the two things that I principally cover are the arts and restaurants. And the arts basically completely died uh, for the longest time. And restaurants are suffering badly. They had a you know a three month shutdown last year, and then they were uh, when they could do takeout, and then they slowly opened back up. So it was really difficult for the two industries I covered, and yet I could do everything I do from my kitchen counter wearing shorts, you know, because it, uh, there were still plenty to cut, to write about. I mean, restaurant struggles and how arts organizations were adapting and just daily news stories and things, but I could do all that. I need, you know, I needed a laptop and a, and a flat surface. And so I have worked from home since, uh, just before the official state shutdown of restaurants on March 16th, our last day was, uh, Wednesday the 11th, starting Thursday the 12th uh, of March of last year. Basically, nobody's been in the Times Union except except people responsible for the, obviously the printing of the paper and the, yeah. the distribution of the of the hard copies. But uh, all of the editing staff, uh, except maybe one or two people, have been working from home. And it it's amazing that in this very difficult time, we've been able to to cover things and and do it so well and so comprehensively uh, in this very difficult time. That's fascinating. They, um, cause I'm a, I work at Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory, so we can't really close down and right. uh, there's, I mean, there's certain groups that can work from home, certain groups that have to be there to get their work done. Uh, that's really the most I can say about what I do <laughs> technically, or sure. I get threatened with death. No, just kidding. But, uh, like my job, I can't really take anything home to work on. So right. they, so this is an entirely new situation for them. So They've kind of set it up now where the stuff, if it comes down to it, like snow days are now a thing of the past. Like if the weather was bad, hey, we're closing down, no work today. Uh, that's not an option anymore. So now they've had to kind of put together a at home stuff you, we can work on. Luckily, they let us focus on like training classes. Uh, and there is some minimal stuff that we can w- work on at home and things like that, that we have to log into their special system for and everything. But, you know, that doesn't get, it's nothing I can do that really actually is what I need to get done when I'm in the office. So it's an uh, interesting balance that I have to walk when that does happen. So I'm basically still working full time. In fact, I just started a new project. So I'm doing a, something over time, which again, is cut it into my hobby time for podcast and video games and reading, which is slightly and drinking, and and drinking. drinking beer. Well, to be fair, I need money to pay for the beer. <laughs> But I, I have also cut back. I try not to drink on work nights, which uh, has saved me a little, a little money and probably a few pounds. So I can't complain about that. And maybe some brain cells. Entirely, yeah, yeah. Probably should try to save, uh, hang on to some of those. <clears throat> but uh, where was I going? How is, I'm curious about the paper industry and the impact COVID has had with, you mentioned you haven't been in the office since March. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it seems like an up and down industry to begin with. What's the impact been like? I mean, I could think of, I mean, I could think of scenarios that would make me think it could go, you know, up or down either way. So I'm curious to hear. Well, uh, as an overall trend, and this is, this is not a secret, uh, the newspaper industry, uh, is doing exceptionally well digitally, you know, for example, about eight years ago. In the last eight years, the New York Times has added uh, is now up to six million subscribers, but almost you know, a, a five million of those plus are digital. Mm-hmm. And the Trump administration was great for online subscriptions for the Washington Post and the New York Times because people felt they had to have that news, uh, and so they've done very well with that. But in in that like in the last decade, something like two thousand newspapers around America have closed. Uh, you know, the, the employment of journalists is down something like 50%, uh, be just because one of the things the newspaper industry did not do well uh, was start to convince people that they should pay for their news. And so we were giving it away for years and years and years for free. You know, you come to our site, but they were never able to monetize those eyeballs because they couldn't get people to pay as much, advertisers to pay as much for digital ads as they were paying for print ads. Uh, And so 
as advertising revenue plummeted, you know, I mean, Craigslist did a terrible thing to newspapers because people all of a sudden were selling things on Craigslist. They were advertising their apartments and homes for sale and cars for sale and everything that, that they were selling in newspapers went online. And so that plummeted, you know, wow. all sorts of things uh, have contributed to the fact that journalism is really struggling. But as we've seen during the pandemic, there has never been a greater need for news. People are hungry for news. And certainly during the, the Trump administration, people, re you saw the, the necessity of the media. And regardless of what the Trump fans are going to say about it being fake news, I've been a journalist now for 30 years. It'll be 30 years in July. And unfailing, the people I work with are dedicated professionals who are in search of the truth and are not driven by agendas. Uh, it came up, somebody that I've known for, I don't know, 15 years, it came up uh, somehow that he was a um, pretty right-wing Trump supporter, is. And if somebody hadn't mentioned it to me, I never would have known it mm -hmm. because he scrupulously keeps it out of his copy and his, his conduct at work. And I thought, and, I, and that's the sort of thing. And I have more freedom because I uh, often have opinions in what I write. Well, I, my news, I try to be scrupulously fair uh, and be neutral about my news, but I, I also have the privilege of an opinion outlet. And so people know what my politics are, but regardless of where people stand, a good professional journalist is interested in the truth, in saying, this is what I found out to the best of my ability. And that's what drives journalism. And it's, it's been essential during the pandemic that people get the information they need. And where do they get it? You can't just, you know, if, you know this, when you, if you're Googling something and you don't have a specific place to go, you could get 2.9 million or 2. 2 million or billion hits. And oh, yeah. Just, where do I go? I need my information curated for me by professionals. You meant something that just came to my mind now that I'm talking to, of course, someone in the news industry. The way, I mean, have you seen a change in the way yourself or colleagues have been treated since, uh, I mean, during the Trump administration? Obviously, the media wasn't treated or put in the best spotlight. Is well, that I mean, something you're, you're being you're being nice about it? The, the media was vilified. Yeah. And it was it became a convenient punching bag uh, that and, and one of the one of the biggest proponents of that viewpoint just died. Rush Limbaugh. And, you know, I. I saw it, it was even something like the, the, a, a local town committee put on their Facebook page that, you know, Limbaugh, you know, God bless you. Uh, Limbaugh, you were on you were on loan to us from the Lord, which is just it was just just crazy uh, that somebody who so was horrible, he was a bigot and he was sexist and he was homophobic, and he more than anyone really contributed and fostered this anti mainstream media. I mean, this was a guy who had a massive audience. You know, at one point I think he was up to 20 million listeners or something crazy. And he was making $40 million a year uh, to be a blowhard. And he was nasty. Uh, and, and his racism is documented. His homophobia was documented. And certainly the media has gotten it from that side. And then there are other things that uh, have been necessary correctives that have come uh, from the Black Lives Matter movement to say, hey, you know, mostly white dominated mainstream media, you need to be better at what you do. And that I think has been very, that has been very necessary. You yeah. know, we've learned some lessons. We've been called on the carpet and deservedly so for some of the choices we've made. And we, we try to apologize for that and do better and be attentive to matters of diversity and issues related to minority communities and lot, you know, lived experiences that are not our own. It's interesting to see the way things have had to change or, you know, like you said, especially just the overall attitude towards the media the last few years. I mean, obviously, you're known a lot, mostly for table hopping and all your reviews and stuff like that. Uh, other than having to work at home since March, I mean, how has your writing changed or how has, you know, the pandemic affected you professionally? Well, being around colleagues, 
makes you a better journalist. Because you know, I have my uh, I'm part of the features department, and we have a, a small core group. And seeing them every day, listening to them, oh, you know, overhearing their inter interviews that they do on the phone, you know, talking to them about words, you know, saying, "Oh, I, I need help with this sentence. Can you fix that?" And and just the joking and the camaraderie. You know, I, I think of uh, friends of mine who have been basically lifelong freelancers, and they're always, you know, in their attic, in their basement, in their home office, just toiling away and so i miss that social interaction and one of the other things people know me from table hopping uh but i've also i, I started in the arts you know I've, I've always covered the arts and i'm the times union's theater critic but and normally i would do you know maybe 75 or 80 theater uh or comedy stand-up comedy reviews a year oh wow so you know uh, it'd be at least uh you know, three, four times a month, uh, or more, sometimes six or eight times a month, uh, that I would go to do a review in the in the summer, you know, I would often have half of those reviews would be in the summer going to the Berkshires, going up to Glens Falls, you know, lot, uh, outdoor stuff in Albany. And I really miss the intellectual stimulation of theater having that live creative art right in front of you. Sure, you can watch a lot of TV. And I've seen some remarkable TV during the pandemic. I burned <laughs> through all sorts of shows that I never have uh, had seen before, uh, but I miss live entertainment. And so while I have gotten remarkable stories from people and they've all been over the phone and you really can't, well, 95% of them are over the phone. You cannot replace the in-person rapport that develops between a reporter and subject when you've got some time to sit and talk you know when i when you do a yes you can you can do a story a feature about a theater production by talking to the director talking to two actors and writer but if you're actually able to go to a rehearsal sit and watch and absorb and spend time together with other people that informs your journalism and i think back over the last year all the times that i didn't go somewhere because you know, it was not deemed safe. You know, people mm -hmm. aren't getting together. The whole point of being together and hanging out uh, is antithetical to what needs to happen to help get us past this pandemic. And so that lack of human interaction uh, in person has, has been difficult, even as we've had remarkable stories to tell. Yeah, I get that 100%. Like I said, when I was only going to the office two days a week, they had broken up who was going to be in on what days. So there was, of course, even fewer people there. And uh, it's gotten back to at least my department's gotten back to a more normal. Uh, our whole group is usually there because of the work that we do. So and just being around everyone, that's really the most the only in person interaction I have, I mean, I go to the store and I started doing this from home for a while because my girlfriend has asthma. So I dialed back all the in person stuff. Don't want to risk it, of course, because you know, cases were going up. I'm hoping, you know, as spring comes more of the vaccine gets distributed thing, you know, the masks are going to be around, I imagine, at least the, through the rest of the year, I would expect it. And I hope that they do to help, you know, stomp this out. But, you know, hopefully things get safer and I can take start taking this back out on the road because I've got a lot of places I want to travel to that uh, and the bucket list now it's just going to be full of travel. <laughs> Once we get to a spot, you know, where it is safe enough to travel and it isn't a huge concern. And the weather's warmer, you can hopefully sit outside. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I miss just being outside. <laughs> so yeah, we... This, this is a very determined winter. La last winter, as I recall, we got one big dump of snow in December, and then there was just occasional uh, snow for the rest of the winter, and it was often warm. This winter keeps reminding us it's winter. It does. Like, it's snowing right now. Not heavy, yeah. but it is snowing. No, it's, it's reminding us that it's winter. I do hate winter so much. If it didn't snow on the roads, I'd hate it less, but, you know, I can't control that. <laughs> How did... So... You've been at the Times Union since 96, over 20 years. When, I mean, what got you interested in the arts and, you know, you're doing, how'd you get into journalism, I should say? I, um, I, I was always involved in the arts. Uh, as a kid growing up, you know, I uh, played brass instruments and was in choir and uh, did a lot of theater. And my father also owned a restaurant for uh, 10 years 
oh, wow. you know, when I was in elementary and in high school. Um, and so I had that as a background. I went to Boston University thinking I was going to be a political science major, but about two months into my freshman year, uh, first semester, I realized I didn't give a crap about the economic <laughs> preconditions for world war in Europe in 1911. <laughs> uh, and a Tweedy professor mumbling into a microphone in a 400 person lecture hall. And then you'd break up into discussions with some, you know, radical political European teaching assistant. I didn't give a crap, <laughs> but fairly quickly into this semester and Boston University had a student newspaper that was a 20,000 circulation daily came out five days a week. Holy cow. Yeah. And it was actually the third largest daily in Boston behind the Globe and the Herald. And then there's the, the daily free press at Boston University. And I wrote an op-ed column for them, um, maybe in October of my freshman year. And they printed it. And I was thrilled that there was my name atop 600 words going out in 20,000 copies of the paper. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> and I wrote another one. And then I wrote another one. They kept printing them. They made me a, I was the first uh, freshman columnist that they'd had in about a decade. Uh, and they made me, a, and I, I had a weekly column for four years. I was also worked uh, on the editorial page and wrote arts reviews and all sorts of things. And came time, to, I understood very quickly that I wanted to be a journalist, but I met a guy by the name who had the improbable name of Fox Butterfield, <laughs> who was the Boston bureau chief for the New York Times for many, many years. Uh, that's such a and, great name. I'm going to be thinking yeah. about that the rest of the day now. He was like an old, he was an old buddy of the Kennedy family and everything. And if Fox Butterfield, and he told me, um, don't major in journalism. It was probably my freshman year. I was, I don't think I ever, I, I switched from political science to English, and I don't think I ever considered a journalism major, but he said, don't, he said, we can teach you everything you need to know to be a journalist in an internship or two. And at that point, my parents had a place on Lake George, and so I applied to be an intern at the Post Star where they had an arts internship, somebody to cover the arts in the busy summer season, because um, I wanted to live on Lake George and, you know, go to Glens Falls. Of and, course. And so that was, a, I spent two summers there. Um, and covering the arts. I mean, what, this was when SPAC used to have a lot, a lot of concerts at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center, including they tried to fill up the two weeks between the New York City Ballet and the New York and the Philadelphia Orchestra yeah. uh, with concerts. And there was, for both summers, I, uh, in that period, I saw 13 concerts in 14 days. Holy crap. Yeah. And so that, you know, you get good uh, at writing fast, but you're also taking notes in the dark because you're in the theater. Now, my handwriting has always been terrible. You know, like in elementary school, I'd get A, 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 and then C in penmanship. Uh, but when you write in the dark for 30 years, uh, your handwriting gets worse. Some days, <laughs> two days after the, after a, a, a performance, I can't read my notes. I can read them and, uh, as long as it's fresh in my mind and I'm writing the review, and then after that, they're useless. Um, so with that, uh, I got like I had only uh, three job offers that I seriously considered when I graduated, um, and one of them was with uh, Time Magazine. But basically, it was writing letters back to people who wrote letters to Time Magazine. That was how you started really? as a very junior person. But it was only four days a week, and it and they didn't have benefits. Uh, and I, you know, and I didn't really know as many people in New York as I do now. So, you know, I was just worried about finding a roommate, not having benefits. So the other one that I chose not to consider was junior education reporter in a suburban bureau of the Cleveland Plain Dealer. So I would be working nights going to school board meetings in suburban Cleveland. And the Troy Record offered me a job as a film critic and arts writer. Nice. So, you know, I was a 22 year old film critic. And back then the, the record, and I feel for colleagues who worked there longer than I did for many years, but it, it got bought by an evil uh, hedge fund that basically eviscerates all the media properties it buys. Oh, really? I didn't know that. And so, and so the, the record has just spiraled down into a minimal circulation. But when I got there, basically the Times Union was 100,000 circulation daily. The Gazette was 75 and the record was 45. 
So it was, a, and it had bureaus, bureau chiefs in Albany and in a capital and covering out the hill towns and everything. So the record was a serious little competitor. And I was writing about the arts and reviewing movies. You know, I, I saw five movies a week for 10 years. Wow. Uh, and it was, it was terrific. And then after five years at the record, uh, the Times Union offered me a job as an arts writer. And I was an arts writer, and then I was the arts editor for six years, and then they invited me to come back to writing as a senior writer. Um, and I, I still, you know, cover the arts, but then uh, I'd always been interested in restaurants, but it took me a year and a half to convince them to launch table hopping. Everybody else was getting blogs in 2004 and 2005, and they're like, oh, there's not enough restaurant news because the way it was previously conducted, the restaurant news was three little items that ran at the end of each week's restaurant review. It was whatever somebody sent in got hmm. typed up into a brief. And that, that was all. And they said, oh, how is there possibly enough? And fairly quickly, table hopping grew into uh, one of the two most widely read uh, and popular single author blogs. Our Capital Confidential blog, which is maintained by more, by more than one person, has, has a bigger readership now um, because you know it's state politics and we're Albany. Yeah. Um, but as a single author blog, Table Hopping does very, very well. And at its peak, I was getting 400,000 readers a month. Holy cow. Yeah. It was, and they've they've changed a number of things. They made it part of the subscription. They put it behind the paywall. They made it more difficult to comment. Uh, and so the the readership is, has declined from from its peak, but it's still really significant. And you know, when I take polls on whatever I may take a poll about, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people vote on those polls. So there's really still strong participation. That's awesome. I can't believe it took them that long for to say, yeah, go ahead and start get table hopping going. Well, they, they just didn't see that there was that much news out there. Uh, but then I, a couple of years after that, I started documenting all of the local openings and closings that I could find. And uh, I don't do, I didn't track chains unless they were the first uh, in the area, like if you know, if, if new Starbucks or McDonald's opens or new Moe's, I don't care. Yeah. Uh, but like when Duck Donuts, which is a franchise, you know, came to Latham, yep. uh, I, you know, I, I covered that. And so in a typical year, there was usually about 100 openings and 60, 60 closings. There, well, you know, those numbers were off last year because of the pandemic, and we won't know fully how many places don't come back. You know, there are plenty of restaurants that said, no, we're not going to do takeout, and then they just didn't reopen with the limited capacity and things. So we'll see that fallout this year as things open back up. But even still, last year, there was something like 70 openings. You know, That's mine. During, during the pandemic, 70 openings. It's mind boggling if you're not really paying attention to it. Yeah. Wow. You know, I mean, we even got our uh, our, our first African restaurant. You know, there, there, there's a, a, a Nigerian couple opened uh, a restaurant on Lark Street in Albany. And we had uh, there was one place that served uh, Ethiopian food. Uh, as part of their menu, it wasn't their whole menu, but they, they do have an Indian Ethiopian feature on their menu. But other than that, we had no food from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa hmm. uh, in the entire capital region. And, and during the pandemic, boom, we went and got a Nigerian restaurant. Yeah, that's it's crazy to see what is able to open and what's able to get by these days. Uh, well, the, the, to get by is 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 tough. Yeah, you know the. Um, I heard so many stories from people in the restaurant business of, you know, trying to get through to unemployment, trying to file their unemployment claims. And then when there was uh, extra money being paid by the federal government, uh, uh, sorry, I'd lost you. I had a, uh, no, I could still hear you. Okay. You're back. Uh, all right. Yeah. It just, uh, <laughs> I had a phone call come in. I thought I shut that off. Apologies. Um, that, some people wouldn't didn't even, wouldn't go back to work. You know, I heard one crazy story. I mean, yes, it was very necessary for a lot of people, but the the excesses of it. I heard a high school girl uh, who worked like two half days a week as a hostess at a restaurant was making eight hundred dollars a week in unemployment. Oh yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, when the when like, they, yeah, you go, girl. That's good for you. Yeah, with the extra pandemic assistance and everything like right. that. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. There's a lot of that happening. But uh, as far as I mean, how did you end up settling on the name table hopping? We just brainstormed. You know, oh, we, okay. We it was four of us sitting around throwing out ideas for you know an hour and one of us it was not mine i you know uh, it was my boss at the time uh who sent me an email like the next day or something she's like how's table hopping <laughs> uh you know and and i said that's it and it, it you know it it just stuck and that was it'll be 15 years in september and it's about eighteen thousand blog posts over that period and two hundred and twenty five thousand comments oh wow that's yeah that's wow that's impressive yeah and back in the old days when it was a lot easier to comment um some of the blog posts would generate hundreds of comments. There was one that it, even to this day still comes up. If you search, uh, just search for uh, Golden Fox, um, the table hopping blog, and there's 100, 300 plus comments. And what it turned, the, the headline was, what was the name of the bar downstairs from the Golden Fox? But it, what it turned into was people reminiscing about 80s bands they'd seen at, at long since defunct places. And somebody would say, oh, uh, you know, did you see and I met my wife at and somebody else said, oh, I remember this great gig by band XYZ. Uh, and, uh, you know, I so wish it had been recorded. And the drummer from that band responded and said, I've got a cassette tape of that. You want me to mail it to you? Wow. It was just a remarkable community conversation that just went on for years. That people just <laughs> reminiscing. It was, you know, and you just you just imagine all these people in their 50s you know, thinking fondly back to when they were teenagers and college students going out and listening to live music and drinking with friends. And here they are, they're, you know, they got kids and careers and don't go out much anymore. And they're just reminiscing. It was extraordinary. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's funny. I work with a lot. I work with a few people from the newspaper industry that have, uh, and so I hear a lot of stories of how it was when they were working and that and things like that. In fact, as I was leaving work yesterday, one guy I mentioned I was going to be talking to you today. Uh, I don't know if you remember him. He wasn't sure if you'd remember him. I guess he spent some time at the Times Union. John Pekarski. Does that name sound sure. familiar? Yep. Worked the sports desk, he said. So he says hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, John. So uh, what was the name? You mentioned your father owned a restaurant. What was the name? You're from Schenectady, right? Uh, well, I'm from Rotterdam. I Rotterdam? Have, I, was it I have since place? recovered from that, <laughs> from being from Rotterdam. And I, I say, and this is mostly true, but not wholly, I say that if I never had red sauce Italian again in my life, I'm fine. <laughs> um, and coming from Rotterdam, that's a terrible thing to say, but it is largely true because, you know, uh, Rotterdam was full of Italian food. Uh, my father's restaurant was in Schenectady. It's a, was in a building that just last year two years ago was was knocked down but it was right uh, basically across the street from the schenectady community college or suny schenectady pardon me and the former downtown y so it was right there it's called the oxbow inn uh it was open from 75 to 85 and it was american steak and seafood oh all right and at that point ge uh was huge and um business lunches were 100% deductible. So there was a Must have been massive, nice. massive lunch business because GE was, you know, a two minute car drive away. Oh, yeah. Uh, so they, yeah, it was, uh, and the, after they'd been open about, I don't know, six, eight months, uh, Fred LeBron at the Times Union came to review it. And I, I eventually um, took, I, I had Fred's job later in life but I, I first met him when I was like eight years eight or nine eight years old uh and one of the things they used to do is the uh you know prime rib sometimes is bone in but often the, the bones would be cut off so they would cut the bones off the rib prime ribs and then slather them with barbecue sauce throw them on the grill and this was the free happy hour appetizer on Friday oh so you know and, and little me at, you know 10 years old would be walking around with a platter above my head of ribs and <laughs> All the GE guys are just grabbing them off the platter. And one night, my father said, 
that's Fred LeBron from the Times Union sitting at the bar. Go take him a rib. And so I met Fred when I was just a kid and event ended up being a colleague of his. And he was the arts editor at the time. And I became the arts editor. Wow. That's a, that's a great story. Are you still teaching or adjunct teaching at SUNY Albany? Uh, I was furloughed. Um, but we'll see. I'm, I am hoping to go back in either the fall or next spring. But I did that for every semester for 12 years. So I did 24 semesters. So, yeah, that's a long time. I yeah, went- and I, I, I would not want to be teaching this year because virtual teaching, and it's, I, I guess I could adapt to it. But part of my strength is being in a room in a writing seminar, you know, commanding the room, talking to 15 young people about making words better. And that's so much easier to do in person. Oh, and, yeah. you, know, you know, I mean, people hide, can hide in the back of a classroom when you're in person. You know, if, if they're doing it virtually, you, just, you, know, you don't even know they're there. The participation is way down. Um, so I'm glad I'm not doing it, but I dearly love it. And I hope to get back in the classroom as soon as possible. That's awesome. I went to SUNY for a year and a half, maybe two, I ended up being academically terminated. I was a computer science major while I was there, but I was struggling. Like I had a lot of those big lecture hall classes. I mean, I was doing fine in my actual computer classes, but all my electives were killing me. And uh, so I was academically terminated. I could have fought it. I didn't. And I ended up going to St. Rose and becoming a communications major. So I actually took at least one news writing class. I took a radio class. I had a, it was a great program there. And I ended up graduating from there with honors. So I definitely don't regret how things played out. But uh, yeah, but SUNY Albany, it's a, I mean, it's a great school. Uh, if you're, if you can handle the environment, it wasn't for me though. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a big place. It is. It was huge. And I didn't know I was there for at least a year and a half before I even knew about underground tunnels. From <laughs> Yeah. So I would freeze my ass off walking a mile from my car to where I had to go for class. <laughs> you still hear me? Yep. All right. Sorry. Right, picture was... dived in and out. No, it was, it was telling me my battery is down to 20%, but I think we'll, we'll survive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We can speed right along. There's one article in particular I had to ask you about because my friend Anthony from Video Game Cross Talk, another local podcast, sent this to me as soon as I said I was going to be talking to you. Article you did back in 2012 about going to night moves. (laughs) 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 I'm sure. So I'm sure you may have been asked about this before. (laughs) Oh, but you know, it's irresistible. It is. I was commissioned by the Colbert Report to review night moves from an aesthetic and artistic perspective. So how did that come about? Uh, Well, uh, oh, and for listeners who may not be familiar, uh, Night Moves is a fully nude uh, strip club, which means they don't serve alcohol because in New York State, if alcohol is served, uh, they can only be, the dancers can only be topless. Uh, Night Moves is fully nude and uh, there's a provision in New York state law that does not charge sales tax on tickets for cultural events. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, if, if you go to uh, a concert at the Times Union Center, there's no sales tax built into the ticket price. But if you go to a sporting event or anything else that's non-cultural, you know, sales tax is built into the ticket. And the owner of Night Moves believed and still does that his dancers should be treated like uh, dancers of any other stripe, you know, like ballet dancers. And so he just refused to go, to collect sales tax on admission. Um, and the state disagreed with him. And he ended up with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in back taxes due. And oh, yeah. his argument was that this is artistic. And so they thought, Colbert thought this would be funny to commission an arts critic uh, to go and apply his aesthetic standards to, uh, uh, to night moves, you know, to say, you know, is it art? And my conclusion is, yes, it's art because there's choreography, there's music, there's rehearsal, there's aesthetic intent. And it all it requires for anything to be art is aesthetic intent. If you hire a, if you 
hire a plumber to install a functioning urinal in your home or your place of business that's functional, it's not art. When Marcel Duchamp hung a urinal on a wall, art gallery wall, that's art. And also requires his aesthetic intent. And so there is no difference in, its, in the basic level between a stripper and a ballet dancer. Now, as it happens, my conclusion on Colbert was that it's lousy art. I mean, it's just crap art. But nobody says Fifty Shades of Grey isn't a novel, okay? It's utter garbage as writing goes. It's some of the worst writing ever to have been consumed by a mass audience. It's shit as you far argue with as, that. you know, as, as far, I mean, bars used to have nights where people would read the worst passages they could find for Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, just as, as, as sort of a performance art stand-up comedy kind of thing. And it's really terrible writing, but nobody says it's not a novel. Uh, it's just as the same as James Joyce, it, you know, writes novels. It's just one is better than the other. Now, you know, Night Moves is crap, but I believe the, the performance, the, my appearance on it went well, and I was one of the few people uh, who didn't look like an idiot because it's the Colbert show. And I, to be clear, I, I was just interviewed by a producer uh, up here. I was not. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I, you know, I, I was not on the show, but you can still find the video. It's on Comedy Central's uh, website. And, you know, you can find it. There's links through the through the Times Union as well. And uh, I had a couple of uh, the most notorious line from it. Uh, at one point, I described how the, the dancer, you know, clambered on top of me as if I were a jungle <laughs> gym. Uh, and then I had I had breast sweat on my glasses. Yeah. Or you know, the red spot that you weren't sure if ringworm or... Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I did. I, I ended up with this thing here, and it was the lip print from the uh, lip print from the dancer. But, I mean, I totally agree. It, yes, it's art. It takes... I mean, that's a skill set, and it's tough. It takes practice. It's presented on stage in an artful type way. Well, it, yeah. I mean, it's, it's done for an audience. Yeah. And, and, and if, if it is considered a valid goal of art to try to evoke emotion, you know, like sadness or happiness or joy or fear all of those are considered legitimate why is lust illegitimate it's because of our you know prudish society oh yeah we're definitely an uptight society <laughs> as as opposed to a lot of other places i mean i'm not a i'm not a strip club guy myself i've been to maybe two or three in my life for like bachelor parties or something like that that's just been a stop in fact, one time I was at one and uh, one of the dancers told me I look like Harry Potter. So that kind of took me out of it. <laughs> so that was, yeah, that made it even more awkward because <laughs> like, okay, I don't know how to respond to that. <laughs> you should have said, is that your thing? I suppose I could have. I was more it's, interested in finding out what's the easiest way to get back to the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think a good way to start wrapping things up is I know the Times Union best of 2021 voting is coming up starting, I think, this Monday, right? Correct. There are 30 or 31 dining categories, everything from, you know, best takeout cocktails and best brewery to best, uh, best Chinese, um, you know, best Southern uh, and it's not giving anything away to say that a restaurant that has one of the older audiences in the area always does extremely well, and I would expect they do extremely well again this year, and that's the Raymond's in Loudonville Colony. It's, you know, it's an Italian restaurant in a price chopper plaza, basically, at the end of a little strip of stores that includes, like, uh, a juice bar and a beverage center and maybe an eyebrow place, and then there's the Raymond's. <laughs> And I was in there with my mother a few years ago and she was in her mid seventies at the time. And she was besides me, the youngest person in the place. Uh, and yet DeRaymond somehow galvanizes that audience and they do very, very well. Hmm. Yeah. That's not one I've heard of. How involved are you in coming up with the categories and. Oh, we talk the about them every year. I mean, okay. and you know, that we have, you know, uh, strong input and I was responsible for, um, my, I think we got something crazy, like 40 plus thousand nominations. Holy and we'll shit. Get, I mean, we'll get 
uh, we'll probably get a million votes, but uh, just the nominations. And so we were in the process as they came in, those had to be moderated because, you know, it, obviously if, if you say, you know, uh, if the category is best Chinese and somebody writes uh, jumping jacks, you know, you, you got to take jumping jacks out of best Chinese. Yeah. You know, he just doesn't belong there. So what we had that, so there were four of us uh, that were moderating these categories and doing, you know, tens of thousands of nominations. Wow. Uh, to, and, and also people, you know, if people are writing something in, um, you know, you, you need the name to be right. You know, there are, there are, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of so people many, that don't know the actual name of the place they're nominating or right. get it wrong. And then it, it, right. Or, or in a cat, you can sort of intuit if it's, if it's best diner you, and it says Jack's, or are you going to assume it's Jack's, uh, the, the central Avenue diner? Um, but if it says, you know, best fit place for a burger and it just says Jack's is this Jack's drive-in out in wine and skill. I mean, Jack at Jack's oyster house and all, but he does have a burger or at least they did when they had lunch and then Jack's diner also has a burger. So, you know, figuring all of that out, it was a lot of time that we put in so we can present and that we got, so there would be dozens, if not scores of nominations within each category. And the way the voting works is the top five vote, get, vote getters uh, will be presented for and you can just, as soon as you go Monday morning at the Times Union website, there'll be a big link there. Vote in our best of. And there's prizes and other things you can get. Um, but the top five in each category will, uh, will be, be presented. So that's, you know, it, it would just be ridiculous to let people vote on, you know, you 50 different nominations <laughs> for, you know, for, for best salad. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a ridiculous amount of great categories between the food and drink, arts and entertainment, all kinds of goods and services and other stuff. One thing I did notice that seems to be missing is best local podcast. Just saying. <laughs> all right. I will. Uh, uh, we will put that into the hopper for consideration for next year. <laughs> there's there's some good stuff out there. And I'm not saying just mine, of course. <laughs> uh I mean, I don't know. There's, I mean, this one, Popcorn and Pints that we started, but Video Game Cross Talk, Horror with Sir Sturdy, Rock Candy is a great music one for, you know, a lot of stuff. Capital Brew Podcast. I talked to a lot of, they talk to a lot of brewers. I talked to a lot of brewers. Good, fun stuff. Do you have What episode places? is this for you? Like, like 38? 41. This will be 41. episode 41. I've been doing this. I'm coming up on three years. I've gotten Congrats. to know a lot of great people. I like to think when it comes to when I'm talking to someone with a business, we're kind of helping each other out, you know, uh, had a lot of beers, <laughs> which is always yeah. great. Yeah. And it, with a longer form, cause I, I've, I, when the pandemic started, I started doing video interviews, um, that at once things opened back up, they, it, it wasn't as necessary, but I did, I did for about six or seven months. I did weekly. Um, and I, I tried to do a half an hour uh, and, and this gives you even more room because the, the brevity of most broadcast interviews, you know, except for 60 minutes and, you know, NPR, but even on NPR, a seven minute story is an eternity. Oh, yeah. So to have the spaciousness of an hour to let a conversation go where it may uh, on the case, you know, could be, you get a dud, uh, but for the most part, if you're talking to people who are interesting and have interesting lives or interesting businesses, and you're curious as an interviewer, you're going to get somewhere. Yeah, and it's been fun. I've heard a lot of great stories. My favorite is when a guest just takes questions and run with it because I can sit there and drink. But <laughs> you know, I've I've learned a lot of great stuff, and you know, it's really gotten to know some great people. And, you know, hopefully people that catch my episodes, check some of these places out. That's so I'd like to think it's a win-win all around. Sure. So blog.timesunion.com slash table hopping. There we and go. There's also a link from the front of timesunion.com. That seems like a perfect way to start wrapping things up here. I think it was another successful edition of stories from a virtual bar as unpleasant as that sounds. It'll be from a real bar again soon, hopefully. Because I miss live places, but I also don't want to get sick and spread it around. So, you know, right. <laughs> Big thanks, Steve. I really appreciate you taking the time to hang out and chat with me. It's been fun Great. hearing I've about enjoyed your time in the business. Awesome. All right. Uh, 
Be sure to check out Steve's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, table hopping to keep up with everything, all the arts or and mostly restaurant stuff going on around the capital region these days. Uh, straight, just think of him wearing his sport coat and shorts at home. <laughs> Thank you. Huge thank you to everyone out there for checking out the show. You can find Stories from a Bar on Facebook, of course, Instagram and Twitter at Stories FAB to keep up with everything going on and coming up with the show. If you're looking for something fun to do on Saturday nights, usually around nine, check out the live stream editions of Popcorn and Pints, uh, where I drink with some friends and we talk about movies. It's ridiculous times, but what else have you got to do? Really, check it out. Uh, you'll find stories from a bar, of course, on all major podcast platforms, Apple, Google, Podbeam, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeart, uh, pretty much anywhere you'll find podcasts. Hopefully you'll see stories from a bar. And more importantly, be sure to subscribe and rate and help spread the word. So until next time, people, cheers. All right. Let me end the live stream.